So if you are joining us from home this morning, welcome to Peoples. I hope you'll be an active participant. You'll find all the words for our readings, prayers, and music on screen. Uh, and as I've said before, the reason we start our live stream later than our in-person service is so that we can share our prayer concerns without sharing them to the entire internet. Uh, so if you happen to have a candle handy, I might invite you to light it now as I light mine. In the season of Easter, we remember that the light of Christ will always shine. Even the darkness of the tomb cannot put it out. Please join with me in our opening prayer from Psalm 97. The Lord is King. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. The heavens proclaim your righteousness, and all the people behold your glory. Light dawns for the righteous, and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to God's holy name. Amen. Good morning. Family of faith, in the season of Easter, we take a moment to praise God instead of offering our confessions because God is always willing to help us grow new life out of the cold ground. Please join me with me in our unison prayer of praise, followed by a time for personal thanksgiving. Let us pray. You are not only risen and alive, you are Lord. This is your ascension, your ascendancy over the whole universe. You stand over and above all that is best in life as its source. You stand above all that is worst as the ultimate victor. You stand above all powers and authorities as judge. You stand above all failure and weakness and sin as forgiveness and love. You are alone worthy of total, total commitment. You are Lord, my Lord and my God. Amen.
Please pray with me. O oh God, as we fully experience the new news, the good news of Easter and look toward the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, open our hearts and minds to your word dwelling within us, calling us to unity in Christ. Our gospel reading this morning comes to us as verses from the letter of Revelation, chapter 22. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let everyone who hears say, come and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Ascension. That is the moment when Jesus, after spending 40 days with his friends post-resurrection, ascended into heaven to return home to God. It's not one of the most well-known holy days or the most popular ones. It doesn't inspire holiday parties or ugly sweaters or special candles or chocolate rabbits or red balloons. Ascension doesn't really come with its own symbols at all, not in the way that Christmas comes with a baby in a manger, or Pentecost comes with red flames, join us next week for Pentecost, wear red, uh, or baptism of the Lord comes with water. Ascension is kind of the opposite, because it isn't about the objects that are present at all in the story, it's about what is absent, Jesus. In March, we began the season of Lent. We stopped saying the word Alleluia, and we remembered the way that Jesus suffered, much like all people suffer on and off throughout our lives. We meditated on love that keeps giving, even in hard times, and on grace that keeps giving, grace until our cups are full to the brim. Jesus was hung on a cross to die, and we hung our heads in shame, for the cruelty and apathy that is so bound to the human experience, however much we struggle to rise above it. In April, after six Sundays of Lent, we came to Easter. We brought back the word Alleluia and filled the sanctuary with flowers and music and collective rejoicing that death is not the end of God's story. Jesus left his shroud behind and was raised from the dead to return to his friends, walking and praying and teaching and eating and laughing for 40 days more. But now in May, those 40 days have ended and Jesus ascends back into heaven. As I imagine the scene, his friends are gathered around him in a semicircle so that they can all be close enough to hear him. After all, most of what Jesus says is hard enough to understand, even if you do catch every word, you know. But what he's saying today is goodbye, which makes even less sense than usual, because, like, not even death could stop Jesus. Why should he ever be limited by anything else? He had spent 33 years being both human and divine. Couldn't he continue? to be their friend on earth? I'm sure they still had plenty of questions. But no, Jesus says goodbye. He says goodbye and then he leaves. 
He ascends straight up into the sky, and I imagine that everyone cranes their necks to watch, and maybe someone tries to grab his ankle, and maybe they're shouting and confusion, but then Jesus is gone anyway. And a cloud passes over to block their last glimpse of him. And then at last, everyone's eyes and faces turn back to earth, and now what they see is each other with an empty space between them where Jesus was supposed to be. And sure, he promised he would send the Holy Spirit, but she wasn't there yet in that confused and heartbroken semicircle with the empty space where Jesus was supposed to be. And yes, Jesus had died before. He left, he died, they thought he was gone, 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 despite all his power and miracles. But he had come back. And if he could come back from death, he could come back from this, right? Right? But still, that seed of hope couldn't quite fill the empty space where Jesus was supposed to be. Because Jesus has always been too big, too unpredictable, too outside the lines, too unexpected. Who could have seen what might happen next? How long were they supposed to wait? Where were they supposed to go? What were they supposed to do with the empty space where Jesus was supposed to be? A few days ago, I was in New Jersey for my seminary's reunion. In between our keynote speaker and an organ concert, three friends and I walked downtown for ice cream, then through the campus of Princeton University to visit their chapel. We did not attend Princeton University, so despite five years of living there, I'd never really had the opportunity to just stand in the aisle and stare at the stained glass windows. So I was standing there, lost in the glass, thinking about colors and metal and ladders and the things that I miss from living in New Jersey. When one of my friends came over and silently showed me a news headline on his phone. Oh, no, not again. Not more dead children shot and killed and fallen into the empty space where Jesus was supposed to be. Not again. And I looked up at the light coming through the windows above the cross. I looked at the empty chancel. I looked at my friend, who's a teacher. It's the same movements I've always imagined at the scene of the Ascension. His followers looked up in disbelief. They looked down in bewilderment. They looked at each other in solidarity. They were there for each other, even when they didn't know what to do. They were there for each other, even when they didn't know what would come next. They were there for each other, even when Jesus left them. They weren't alone because they had each other, because they had learned from Jesus to love and care for each other, because they shared a hope in the great miraculous mystery that they trusted would come to them because Jesus had blessed them and left them with work to do. Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 51, the story of the ascension. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. 
Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. I wanted to share a reflection on the Ascension written by Loretta F. Ross on the Praying Life blog. She writes, Something new is coming, something incredible beyond imagination and manipulation, something promised. Well, maybe, that is to say we hope it is. He said it would. We watched him rise up out on the hill with blustering, wind blustering all around and the jagged saw of goodbye chewing us apart. Don't go. Don't go. We love you so. And the love filling us up and tipping us over with its force. And us, breathless and blown, rolling and tumbling down the mountain, flung and spinning out from the center of that splendor. His words imprinted on our souls like a bright tattoo. And the angels saying, get up, get going. He said to wait, wait. There would be more, something else. Spirit, he called it, who will help us remember it all. Help us catch our breath and give us legs for such a world as we have glimpsed. Why not him? Why not Jesus? Why this spirit thing? When we had a love, we could hold in our arms and look in the eye. The Father, reaching down into humanity, snatches back the offspring of God's selfless, effervescent generosity. Dear God, catching up, very God, a very God, begotten, not made, by the scruff of his collar, and drawing him back into your joyful dance. What are you thinking? Cutting in like this, sweeping off with our partner. Life is eternal. That is good news. But what to do with the life and the love left here as we are, knocking about in the flesh? Please Do not ask of us such vulnerability, this being clueless with nothing to hang on to, suspended between cloud and fire, dangling from only a dim memory and a bright promise. I wanted to share her reflection because I was so struck by the moment between Ascension and Pentecost as being such vulnerability, this being clueless with nothing to hang on to, at least not yet. Vulnerability. It can be hard to know what to do with the space between Jesus leaving and the Holy Spirit coming down, and to name that is to be vulnerable because we admit that sometimes we feel lost. And so I called this morning's sermon untitled, not because I couldn't think of a title, but because we never quite have a name for the in-between moments of our lives. Gaps that aren't transitions per se, aren't quite waiting periods, chapters without headings, because we don't know what will come of them, even when we choose to believe that the next chapter or at least the one after that, will be filled with joy. So here we are, in the unknown, untitled, deeply vulnerable, empty space where Jesus is supposed to be. On the one hand, we know that he is actually here, whether or not we can see him, but on the other hand, he's not doing what we desperately wish he would do. There are some things he leaves up to us. We are his arms to hold each other in grief. We are his feet to bring the gospel to the places it needs to be heard. We are his eyes to see people living on the margins. We are his ears to listen for cries for help. 
We are his legs to run towards the places we'd rather not go. It can feel like we're dangling from only a dim memory and a bright promise, but we're just stepping into something new. And if you only look around, you'll see that you're not stepping into that fragile newness alone. So stay with me, abide with me, even when the night falls fast and dark and uncertain, abide with me. Jesus will send us the Holy Spirit. We'll wait together and we'll work together. And somehow we'll find a way to both make and keep peace in this world that God loves so much.
So my seminary is small enough that instead of having class reunions, it's just reunion and anyone can show up. So uh, I convinced a group of friends to go with me this year because our, uh, um, our chaplain is retiring at the end of the year after apparently 15 years of, of being there, which you know, I guess is fair. Anyway, um, she's the one who gave me the phrase, when we pray together, we multiply our joys and divide our sorrows. And so Jan Ammon gets credit for that phrase because like her, it is, it is beautiful and well-spoken. Anyway, please pray with me because when we pray, we multiply our joys and divide our sorrows. God, we need you now. We needed you yesterday. We need you today. We need you tomorrow. We need you now. We need you to do something to stop the brutal, unfathomable violence that is surfacing in every part of our world. We need you to change the hearts of lawmakers. We need you to change all of our hearts so that we may not point the finger at those around us and recognize it is not we versus them, but it is us. It is our fellow human beings. Help us to be the change. Teach us. Move us today. Not to wait until tomorrow, but to care for all of our siblings now. Our black and brown siblings who are being mercilessly killed. Our children whose lives are being cut so very short. Our people everywhere who are either killing or being killed. We cry out to you, God, on behalf of the unbearable cries we hear from the parents who will never see their children again. We cry out on behalf of the sibling who lost their last family member. We cry out on behalf of the entire families murdered. We cry out that you will change our lawmakers' hearts. We cry out, God. We cry out to you because well, we know that we must act, that you must act, that we all must do something. We also need to talk about it. We need to talk about it and not push it away. And so we still choose to talk with you, to demand that something will change in our broken world. While it is broken, God, while we pray that you may act today, we also ask for your comfort. We ask for your comfort in the midst of the unfathomable. We ask for your comfort because we need it to give us strength to keep going. We ask so much of you, God, and yet we know that you are the one who can stir our confused, broken, suffering, and deeply grieving hearts. God, we have experienced the utter murder of the innocents. We will never understand it, God. We know that there's nothing to understand. What we try our best to remind ourselves is that your balm is still there. You are holding us. Because, God, there is no way we can hold ourselves. God, we lift up to you the families and community left behind after the massacre in Uvalde, Texas, at Robb Elementary School, where at least 19 children and two teachers were killed. God, in this country, we honor this weekend those who gave their lives in service to this country. May we remember that their sacrifices bought freedom and liberation to our own nation and many others. Their sacrifices were not for the sake of holiday sales. God, we lift to you our continued collective grief over the mass shooting at a Topps Friendly Market supermarket in Buffalo, New York. 
We lift up to you the people of North Korea where COVID-19 outbreak continues to accelerate. We lift to you the now captured city of Mariupol, Ukraine, where we now see unfathomable footage following weeks of Russian bombardment. We lift up those in Canada, the United Kingdom, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and the United States as we hear about the outbreak of monkeypox. We lift up Taiwan and China as tensions between the two countries heighten. We lift up soccer players representing the U.S. men's and women's national teams who will finally receive the same pay regardless of gender. God, we so clearly need you now. We need you in this broken, confused world where our youngest and our oldest are ruthlessly murdered all around the world. We will never understand it. And so that's why we desperately need you. We need you to come to this world and make change in all of our hearts so that one day the brokenhearted may be healed and the creation of more broken hearts may cease. We pray together the words Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus prayed, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Living in the world, we gather the gifts we have received and bring them before God, offering back what we have so that the world may know the love of Christ and become one. If you are able to, please place your offerings in the plates being passed. Alternatively, if you wish, if you visit peoplespresbyterian.org, you'll find a donate button at the top of the uh, at the top of the page that will link you directly to a secure page where you could make a donation online. We appreciate the generosity of the people's family as we live out our faith in mission and ministry.
As Elisha took up Elijah's mantle, we present these gifts that through them the church may take up the mantle of Christ and proclaim his word to the world through acts of justice and love. Amen. Please join with me in reading our affirmation of faith from the Confession of 1967. In Jesus of Nazareth, true humanity was realized once for all. Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, lived among his own people and shared their needs, temptations, joys, and sorrows. He expressed the love of God in word and deed and became a brother to all. The risen Christ is the savior of all humanity. Those joined to him by faith are set right with God and commissioned to serve as his reconciling community. Christ is head of this community, the church, which begins with the apostles and continues through all generations. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals his love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinners. The power of God's love to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of his love.
seated. So I'm sure I've mentioned before that I was 10 years old when Columbine happened. So I grew up doing active shooter drills alongside fire drills and earthquake drills because I grew up in California. And uh, I have a nibbling who's about the same age now. And society didn't fix it for me as a child. And we haven't fixed it for my nibbling yet either. It doesn't really seem like much good news this week. Sometimes the good news is the church that we are here for each other, even when we can't hear the good news. So as you sit this morning, and as you go out into the week, I encourage you to write letters and make phone calls and comfort those who are left beside you in the empty space where you thought Jesus was supposed to be. I want to remind you again, the next week is Pentecost, so the color of the day is red. So I uh, encourage you to join us. We have a uh, fun and exciting project that will be hands-on next week. So we'll actually be gathering in a uh, fellowship hall. The live service will not be, um, the service will not be live streamed. Uh, so we have things going on that will be fun and exciting and you should come to find out what they are and wear red. Um, so friends, Christ was with us even before his birth. Christ was with us even in the grave. Christ is with us now, even after he has ascended into heaven and gone home to God. God has always been with us in the empty spaces, no matter how bleak they seemed, and God's with us now. May God bless you and keep you, be kind and gracious to you. May God's face shine upon you and give you peace. And from wherever you are, serve the Lord, creator, son, and Holy Spirit.